You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Gearcast. Today, John Harris and I, along with Jason Tables, will be discussing fast, wide aperture, wide angle lenses. Also joining us is Neil Gershman, one of our top pro sales associates in the B&H Superstore, who some of you might know as that guy at the pro counter who really knows his stuff. The first part of the show, we're going to define what a wide angle lens is, what focal length they start, why you'd want a wider aperture faster uh, wide and ultra wide angle lens. Talk about some of the applications, who uses them, why they would need them. I'm going to take a short break. We're going to come back and then talk about the lenses that are available. And we have hundreds of them here from 35 millimeter down to 14 millimeter, all of them F2 or faster. If you enjoy our podcast, and you are not currently subscribed, head on over to iTunes during our break and subscribe. It's free. And a box of donuts says you're going to feel a lot better about yourself after you sign on. It means a lot to us when we see the numbers grow because that means that we're doing a good job doing one of the things we love doing most, talking about picture taking. And if you're already a subscriber, thank you so much for signing up, as we say around here. A special shout out today to Leopold Desage, one of our growing number of dedicated listeners. Thank you for your support and glad to know you like our show. Okay, next up, Al's Gearhead Pick of the Week. On August 21st, we have the Eclipse, or some of you like saying the Eclipse, coming up. And we have some very, very uh, uh, neat kits here for those of you who want to take pictures of it. A few weeks ago, we had the Eclipse uh, podcast. If you didn't listen to it, it's there on iTunes. You can get it, a lot of great information. So the big deal of, uh, uh, we have here is the Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter F5 to 6.3 DGOSHS. M Contemporary Lens Solar Eclipse Kit for Canon EF and Nikon F. What you get is a Sigma 150 600 millimeter, which is a monster zoom. Uh, it contains an FLD and three SLD elements, a hypersonic motor for autofocusing, optical stabilizer with accelerometer. This is big stuff. Uh, and also, uh, it, it, aside from the fact that it has huge magnification, it has a minimum focus distance of 110 inches, uh, and it is splash and dust proof uh, as well. And it comes with a 95 millimeter neutral density 5.4 filter. It's a kit because it comes with that filter. That's right? it. That's right. what makes it basically, it makes it safe to, uh, to aim this thing at the sun. You just sold right. one of these, right? I sold one of these yesterday too. He's a photographer uh -huh. and he's into the Eclipse. So he came by and took one and, and wanted to have some time to play with it, get used to it, had some questions about it. So he's going to be working with that. And you just said something really important yes, too, in that, and that we, we couldn't emphasize enough that if you're going to be photographing this eclipse, don't undo the box that afternoon and expect to just get up and running. You really should do a couple little tests, see how things work and everything else, right? Yeah. It goes for a lot of equipment. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, no, yeah. definitely. Yeah, we talked a lot about that in that episode. We yeah. Practice, you know. Today's topic, fast, wide aperture, ultra wide angle lenses. And actually, I want to qualify what we're talking about. Uh, these are, are lenses that uh, are in 35 minutes millimeter terms uh, are wider than 63 or 64 degree angle of view, which means 35 millimeters. So if you're shooting with 35, 35 millimeter is where uh, um, wide angle starts. And we're only going to be talking about lenses that are F2 and fast. We're talking about real fast ultra wide angle lenses and wide angle lenses. So let's start off uh, a, a little question here. What is a wide angle lens? A wide angle lens, it's a lens with a focal length that's less than the diameter of the camera sensor, or in the case of film cameras, the borders of the film gate. And Neil, feel free to jump in if I say anything dumb or you have even a better description of it. Um, a, just as a point of reference, a full frame 35 millimeter image me measures 24 by 36 millimeter. The diameter is 43.3 millimeter, which means that for a normal lens for 35 is truly 43.3 millimeter. Now, 
if you go and ask for a normal lens for a 50, a 35 millimeter 50. camera, it's going to be a 50, 55, or 58, okay? And that's just the way they did it. Uh, and the bottom line is nobody ever made a 43.3 millimeter lens. Nobody. So, uh, <laughs> but that's where it is. So today we're talking about lenses with focal lengths shorter than 43.3 millimeter. Those are wides. And okay, history. For the longest time, if you shot with a 35 millimeter reflex camera, 35 millimeter lenses were as wide as they got. Wide angle lenses just really weren't applicable for reflex cameras. Why do non-rectilinear designs were available, but only for use with rangefinder cameras with shoe-mounted optical finders because the wide-angle lenses of the time poked so far into the camera body there was no room for a mirror. Uh, in the late 40s and 50s, lens, manufa lens manufacturers began figuring out ways of widening our fields of view. The modern rectilinear, retrofocus wide-angle lenses as we know them today were introduced by Ingenue, a French company in the early 1950s. They were designed for motion picture cameras, but they were quickly adapted to work with, with mirror reflex housings found in film SLRs and now DSLRs. By the time the 60s came around, wider lenses, 20 millimeter, 18, 15, even a gorgeous distortion-free 13 millimeter rectilinear lens by Nikon came to market. Uh, lots of luck if you could find those right now, the 13. Um, and, and they had edge-to-edge -edge sharpness and they were relatively distortion-free. Today we have lenses as incredibly wide as the Voigtlander Heliar Hypar Wide 10 millimeter f5.6 is spheric, which delivers an astoundingly sharp, evenly illuminated and near distortionless 130 degree angle of view. And it's available in Sony E-mount and M-mount and a few others. Uh, I shot with it, it's, it's insane. You gotta be careful with that lens. You could hurt yourself. <laughs> those but, around you. Right? And those around me, that's right. Okay, but for today's show, we're gonna uh, limit our discussion to the fastest of the genre, meaning wide angle and ultra wide lens, wide angle lenses with max maximum apertures of f2 or faster and these are in my book the fun lenses um so, so yeah let me just throw this out why is there a need to get fast with a wide angle lens especially an ultra wide okay are we jumping ahead or is that no no go you want to jump most on? mostly for interiors mm -hmm. or people shooting at, in outside at, at night they want a fast lens uh often lenses wide angle lenses are very popular for landscape you don't need the, the fast lens for that so much. You're on a tripod. You could use a longer exposure, not a problem. So I think more for interiors, the mm -hmm. speed is is always desirable. And then the uh, also for shooting at night, lower light. I know, mean, if you think it. about it, if you it, like the 14 millimeter 1.8 Sigma art lens or anything, F2, 1.8, uh, 1.4, anything like that, if you're shooting at night, you don't have to pump the ISO up. Your your exposures are shorter. You have a lot more control. You don't have to worry about noise as much and a lot of the problems that – Arise with night photography. With higher, with higher ISO. Yep. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a big advantage there. That's where the, it's always good to have. It's the kind of thing, it's it's better to have it and not need it than need mm -hmm. it and not have it. You could always stop now at the 16. <laughs> if you need to, it's no so problem. So basically yeah. the reasons yeah. that we would want any lens and to be fast. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. You say you could always stop down to 15. Lots of people come into the store and they have this concept that if it's a 1.8 lens, that's it. It doesn't go anywhere else. It's yeah. always 1.8 lens or it's always 2.8 lens. They don't realize that they can buy the lens. They can also stop down when they need to. So, and also, you say, what's the advantage of it? With lenses in general, okay, almost universally, the sharpest aperture, the point where the lens resolves the most detail is about two and a half to three stops down from wide aperture. Now, if you have an F4 lens and you want to get the best, so now you're going from four, five, six, eight, you're at F11, to get maximum, whereas if you have an F2 lens, you're now down, what, F4? So, yeah, that's F the advantage. Just even even if you're not going to shoot wide open to get the maximum yeah. aperture, you'll get your sharpest point at, at still a wider aperture, so you're getting more light. Yeah, and, and you can always stop down for more depth. that's always the problem. Exactly. You know, occasionally, people need f filters. They have too much light, but much more often, there's not enough light. That's always the big issue. And that's so also the thing, two things. Also, focusing with wide-angle lenses, if it's an F3.5, a 4 lens, or even a 5.6, focusing can be tricky. Even though you have a, a lot of latitude, you can still miss the shot. Even though you think everything is in focus at F11, F16, you could still miss it. So with a wider aperture, it's a brighter screen. It's easier to zoom in and actually find focus on your subject. Right. And the wider aperture on, on an SLR makes it, it – 
it's not easy to manually focus right. when you're focusing mm -hmm. on an SLR. So the wide aperture for that reason also makes it easier if you're manually focusing. A lot of lenses are manual focus. The mirrorless cameras, it's much easier. You have focus aids, focus assist, yeah. but on the SLRs, those don't exist and it's much harder. So if you've got a lens that's a slow lens, a smaller aperture, then it's harder to see. So yeah. making it harder to focus. Yeah. And the past few weeks, I've used the Firin 20 millimeter F2 from Tokina, uh, which is really, really nice. And the uh, and then I had a week with the Sigma 14 millimeter F1.8, which is crazy. Mm. Um, and focusing very, very close with those is magnificent. And I was I own several ultra wides, and they're all three five to five six. And I was taking pictures with those two lenses. I cannot take with slower lenses because by opening them up, my depth of field is narrower. I can do real selective focus, which is harder to do with a wide angle lens, especially, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So because everything's in focus. <laughs> everything's in focus. So it gives you a lot more creative uh, abilities and a different visual dynamic. So there's a lot of arguments uh, to be had for it. And what about disadvantages then? Weight. Size, Size. <laughs> yeah. price, price, price. Generally too. speaking, wider angle lenses are more expensive, more difficult to make, so the co cost is higher. Mm -hmm. But uh, especially but when you get to the wide aperture lenses. Okay, so basically, they're going to get bigger too. I mean, that's yeah. another issue. They get they get heavy. They get yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, one heavy. of the things that concerned me using uh, the fourteen one eight uh, on on a, I had it on my Sony A seven R two is that. Usually with a large, heavier lens, they put a collar on it so you don't have to put a stress on the camera mount, the lens mount. And honestly, I was not real comfortable about hanging that 1418 off the front of my Sony camera on a tripod, mounting it on the camera, on the camera because yeah. that, that was just too much weight. Yeah. Um, and I really handheld it from, a, from just about everything, and everything came out very well, I might add. Yeah. So there, there are actually supports that you can get, yes. like a lens support. You know that goes. In my review, like I actually added that, and I made suggestions. Yeah. We do sell uh, additional supports that you can do that. So yeah, that's that's and important. And with some of those lenses, that's good to have. Yes, like said, yeah. even the twenty four seventies, they have a lot of weight. Hand these lenses yeah. weigh about two and a half pounds. That's a lot of stress to throw on mm -hmm. a lens mount. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a good idea. Maybe I can ask this question before we start getting into yeah. the talking points we have here. But uh, what is the uh, how do I phrase this? The evolution of these lenses. How come it's taken to this point to get wide angle lenses with such a wide aperture? Is it just something that they needed a technological breakthrough? Was it, uh, is it a matter of price and people are now more interested or why are we, you know, I think why is it lens technology, I think itself, it's, the manufacturing, yeah. they with, especially with computers, mm -hmm. that was a major thing. Uh, that, I, that's what brought in the spheric surfaces and all this. Right. We have the technology to do it now. I, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's technology. I mean, uh, just in general, the much improvement over the years in, in distortion in the lenses, barrel distortion, and that that's improved. And it's, it's just in the manufacturing process so the technology has come along. I tell people all day long, just like in the cameras, some people don't think about it. There are certain things that they think, it, you know, oh, it's the same. A lot of the old lenses are beautiful, but you'll probably find more distortion, more mm -hmm. likely in some of the older lenses than the newer lenses. Yes. Uh, because the technology has, has improved tremendously in the lenses as well as in the cameras. Another big problem with digital cameras early on was that if you went wider than 35, you had all kinds of uh, color fringing and smearing and all kinds of weird stuff because- the, You still get they, some of that weird You stuff. still do. <laughs> However, the, uh, like for instance, I have a 15 millimeter Voigtlander, the, the, the version three, the first two were real sketchy, mm -hmm. but that lens works beautifully on, at least with the Sony a7 or two, um, where I don't get color fringing, it's really clean, and also less vignetting, much, much less. So that's another thing with uh, uh, design. They've managed to keep the edges brighter because I think if you use a some, lot of the earlier lenses, they get dark in the corners. I've had some customers coming in and they were asking for lenses that vignetted. They liked the look. You know, they had an old Leica and they, they liked that kind of lens. They wanted it to vignette. And I said, you know, usually people are trying to avoid that now. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to find. I said, maybe Photoshop. You know, you can, you can always do that. Is, yeah. there one, is, is there one company that's kind of leading the way with, uh, with wide aperture, wide angles at this point? Ooh. I, you know, I think across the board, certainly yeah. Nikon, Canon, they have their share, but um, Sigma is just doing amazing things with lenses these days. Wide aperture and, you know, general uh, one four lenses for full frame. And they have these two zoom lenses for the APS-C sensors, the 18 to, to 35. That's mm -hmm. 1.8 zoom lens, 1.8 
That's it. You can't find any others. And a 50 to 100, so that, not a wide and angle. Also but the, uh, uh, they also make the 24 to 35 F2. Right. Which right. is pretty which extraordinary. Is a, right. I, I, and that's – it's a great lens. Uh, you know, people – People are funny. I've had some people complaining it's not enough range. Of course, everyone wants more. You know, they want they want a lens to go from from fourteen to three hundred and, and be the f two point eight. And yeah. F, yeah. Exactly. No, I, actually, I prefer uh, one four, I, and I want to make sure they can fit into my coat pocket. <laughs> okay. I say it's probably technically possible, but you wouldn't be able to lift it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> be very dense. Is there, any, is there any way to determine how? Big a lens will be a wide angle lens based on its aperture. I know they get bigger as the apertures get wider, the max aperture. But is there a way to say, hey, it's just going to be too big when you go to that point? You know, it's funny. I've seen some lenses that have ridiculously wide apertures, and you look and say they're not big lenses. Right. It, it, I can't I, identify them right now, but I've seen. I them. think as a general rule, the wider the aperture, the bigger the lens is going to be. It has yeah, to. You know, be, I tell yeah. people all the time well, also that element, right? they're looking for fast zoom lenses. Three things, big, heavy, and expensive all the time. Yeah. There are some exceptions. I mean, if you're looking at prime lenses, there are certain you can you can compare Nikon and Canon 51.4 to to let's say Sony's 51.4, which is much bigger, or or Sigma's 51.4, which is much bigger. And then you also, what is it that the Zeiss um, they make one? It's like a five thousand yeah, dollar. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. They they. Um, Otis. The Otis. The Otis. Okay. Yeah, those are huge. Yeah. They're huge. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Know. I think it's filled with concrete. I mean, I think it's big. It's big and heavy. <laughs> yeah, but big yeah. and heavy. <laughs> nice, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm uh, done with the questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, other reasons to justify it. Depth of field. Okay, what... With these faster lenses, you have much narrower depth of field, especially close up. You could really isolate. I, I was amazed how much I could isolate something very close up, a subject, and blow it away from the background, even foreground, which is something I wasn't used to with slower ultra wides. Once you get a four to five, six, is everything's much more in focus. So that's a difference. You could separate it, and the dynamic range, uh, the, the the visual dynamics is just just huge. I just really like. The look of it. Yeah. And that's obviously something super important. If you're going to go with a, a wide aperture, you yeah. can do that. You can't do it otherwise. So, no. And yeah. you could always stop down, but you can't. There's a limit to what you could open up. Also mm -hmm. growing in popularity for video. Mm -hmm. The wide angle yeah. and, and fast. Fast is, you know, fa yes. again, fast is always good. Yes. More light is always better. Um, but for video, there's there's more demand for wider lenses as well. And yeah, and absolutely. That's just that much more control you have. Yeah. So it's a real important thing. Uh, and with depth of field, also when you open up to the wider apertures, uh, the bokeh, the, the quality of the out-of-focus highlights, the specular highlights on a lot of these lenses, just really pretty. Mm -hmm. It just melts away. I've gotten some really impressive images. I, I've been blown away by what I saw. Um, filters could be a problem. Filters definitely could be some a problem. Some of these uh, you can't do. Some of them do have filter threads, um, but be aware that Wider than 20 millimeter, you got to be careful of polarizers. It won't be total. You can have a they dark part the of the sky and other part. Of now, you could fake it sometimes. If you have clouds in the sky, you could sometimes play around with it and sort of have the bright spot where a cloud will be and still punch the blue, but it's, it's it doesn't not cover even. that wide. No, angle. past 20 mil, past cover. 90 degree angle of view, you're it's you're out of luck. And now, um, most of these lenses are going to have a, uh, a convex front. Many of they them. They vary. Some do. Some don't. I some, know. yeah. Some of them are actually impressively flat. Uh, but filtering in general, if you, if you can, make sure that it's it's a narrow, uh, um, slim filter. Slim filter. Um, a lot the of the vignetting. filters now they used to have B and W, for example, used to make a slim filter Hoya. Now they're just they're all, slim. all slim. Yeah, they're pretty much all slim. They're all slim. But you still have with the ultra wide lenses. There's always that risk. Somebody's got a filter, a UV filter on front of the lens. They might need to take that off when they put uh, yes. a polarizing or something else. And polarizing is their own issues, but it's something else, even a neutral density filter, whatever they're using, variable neutral density for video, uh, you start to vignette. And also, some, some, that's a good point. And some of these lenses, by the way, have rear filter slots where you could actually put them in behind or uh, the elements. So they have a little, uh, it makes it a little bit easier to do. Um, another thing you have to be careful with, um, I've noticed, <laughs> and I noticed this most when I was using the 10 millimeter Voigtlander, make sure the front of the lens surface is clean. Because when you stop that 10 millimeter or even a 12 millimeter down to F16, okay, yeah. guess what? The dust on the front element comes into, comes focus. into focus. That's oh. called depth field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I found you really have to be careful. A quick question. Yeah. Um, 
Do you have better luck with vignetting with circular filters or with the square on the holder in general? I've heard I've heard it's better with if you use it. The, the, the holder, square, yeah. the drop in filters are better. They're more versatile. It's you know, and quality wise, it's it's better to use that. It, mm-hmm. Again, it yeah. depends on the lens. With the ultra wide, you really have to be careful. You can get a bigger filter. They make adapters to attach that filter holder that are for wide angles. So it you know it, it compensates as much as it can. But if yeah. you start, you know, some people use they'll have. Uh, use step up rings or something instead of getting the right adapter, and you start to bring that filter further, holder further away, and then you can have vignetting. For sure. Vignetting, right, right, right. Yeah. If you ever look at the butterfly shades they put onto a lot, there's a reason why they got so many cutouts because these lenses see so much. Mm-hmm. The you got to be really careful. Yeah, yeah, but people like those. They like the way they look, so they want that hood, even though <laughs> I keep telling them, you know, that for that lens, the, the hoods are dedicated for the lens. They make them specifically to get the most maximum coverage. But no, no, I like that hood. I like the way it looks. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I'll tell you one thing I'll, I'll, I'll grant for those things, okay, whether you like the look of them or not. You have to be careful. A lot of these lenses, especially the ones with the bulbous front elements, it is so easy to scratch those. I mean, mm-hmm. I once trashed a 16-millimeter sure. Zeiss lens because – and it was – I wish I had a shade on it. Square yeah. trade. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> now they tell me. Um. <laughs> but it's true. They're, with, they're, they're heavy. They're front heavy. They hang down. Yeah. And they bump into stuff. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, in, it's inevitable. Uh, size and weight. We already talked about the wider the aperture, the bigger the lens, the heavier. So that, that's, that's a given. More of these lenses now have image stabilization, which it might sound silly, but the truth of the matter is, I think especially with the higher resolving video. power cameras and video, you want it. You have it. So yeah. that's a feature that's built into a lot of these uh, lenses now. Um, DSLR versus mirrorless lenses. If a lens is designed for a DSLR, it's going to be bigger. There are some smaller lenses uh, for the mirrorless counterparts. Ah, he's shaking his head. Go ahead. And throw <laughs> I, it in there. Go I, ahead. I, I kind of disagree. I think that <laughs> the size of the lens is more related to the size of the of the sensor not to the camera. We actually had this conversation, yeah. and I agreed with you earlier, and I just read the same thing anyway. Yes, you're right. <laughs> if you, because if I mean, if you look at the at the fast zoom lenses, the 24, 70, 70 to 200 from 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 Sony, they're just as big and heavy as the Canon or the Nikon 70 yeah. to 200 or Tamron or whatever. Uh, so basically, they're the same size. That the size of the lens is more determined by the by the uh, sensor size. True. I think. Yeah. That's Points right. taken. By the way, you mentioned 24 to 70 millimeter. Uh, one thing I want to do, before anybody uh, uh, out there says, they're not talking about 24 to 70 millimeter. Well, the reason why is because there we have about 20 of them on the B&H website. They're f2.8, and we said we're sticking to f2. And yes, all of those 24 72 8s are amazing. I don't think there's a bad one out there. Great lens, great range, nice and fast for that focal length, but it ain't part of today's topic. Yeah, that's another show. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll do a show on 24 to 72 sure, eights, okay? Sure, we'll have to work sure. on that one. But going back to mirrorless, <laughs> I mean, are the options available in APS-C for this type of wide angle? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have plenty yeah. of choices for yeah. those. There's ultra wides for, for um, APS-C Olympus and, and, and Panasonic and for Fuji. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also for Sony, for the smaller... Smaller sensor and right. for the bigger sensor, right. not not as much in the ultra wide prime lenses. Mm-hmm. They they're still building that uh, lens uh, lenses. The old Sony A mount lenses. There's plenty of them. But, yeah. F2 but the E mount, they're still the, no. The zoom lens is uh, sixteen thirty five. Right. Is f four. They have twenty eight f two. You know they have a few, but it's it's not uh, not as readily available. Even for the small sensor, the ten to eighteen is f four also. Right. So yeah. there are wide angle lenses, but not that fast. There's twenty three from Fuji. That's f two, um, not ultra wide, but you know they also there's also a zoom that's f four. Okay. I think so far we might have given the impression a lot of these lenses are expensive, and I think it's important to point out that no, uh, they're not. Uh, after our break, we're going to come back and go over some of the options that are out there. But what's very interesting is that there are many price points available for these lenses. Construction, uh, plastic, or as you like to say, polymer, uh, versus weather-sealed metal alloy. And there are some also, I think, some of the polymer ca- uh, lenses are uh, also weather pretty resistant. Pretty pricey. And, and they can also be pretty, pretty pricey, pricey too. <laughs> but it, but that's one of the things too. The lesser priced lenses tend to be a little bit more plastic. Mm-hmm. Um, vignetting can be an issue. Some lenses will vignette more than others. Means the, the corners are darker. And that's correctable. 
okay, in, in most cases. Um, well, speaking of price, I'm looking at a couple of the new Sigmas here, the 14 millimeter F1.8, that's $1,600 lens. Yeah. Uh, and, but when you go to the 20 millimeter F1.4, that's a $900 lens. And these are all Sigma for DSLRs. Um, a Nikon AFS Nikkor 20 millimeter F1.8, that's a $800 lens. So the prices roll around. Yeah. They're all around. Well, they're yeah. not cheap, though. No, I mean, they, no. they do jump around. Um, and the build quality, uh, you know, the advantage always for buying a Nikon or a Canon lens for your camera is that it's made by Nikon, it's made by camera, they've designed it, they've designed the electronics, you're much less likely to ever have, like, communication issues. That is a big thing, yes. So that, that's that's one good, solid reason. Um that being said, some of the lenses, the Sigmas that you just mentioned, they're outstanding lenses. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can't write them off just because they're not made by Canon and Nikon. They're great lenses. And Tamron's making a few good lenses as well. well and Tokina and, has always. You know, well, yeah, and Tokina, well the, the fear on us, that's their version of their answer to the art lenses and, and uh, from uh, Sigma. Yeah. These are not, they're not made by the main manufacturers uh, as far as camera companies, but boy, those are very good lenses and right. they're serious about them. Generally not inexpensive, but right. often a little less expensive than the brand names. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so really great values. Yep, absolutely. I'd like yep. to get into some of the applications and specific types of photography that these lenses are more or less value, valued for. And I know we spoke about that earlier, but I have one question. And I was looking at the, the Milvis, the Zeiss Milvis line, and they have 15 millimeter, 18, 21 millimeter. They're all F2.8 though. Now, what would be their... Why wouldn't they go down to F2? What would be the disadvantage for them other than it's too expensive to manufacture and sell? Or is that My, my guess is I mean, size, weight, and they may not be happy with cost. the image quality. Yeah. And so cost, I mean, for technically, sure. Obvi technically, it gets more difficult the wider you get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the wider so, and faster, so those are challenges. But, they, but there are 15, yeah. you know, 18, so they get pretty wide as well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and, and the Zeiss lens is certainly... I don't know that price is the object is the problem because they've got some lenses. Those Otis lenses, for example, are right. crazy forty five hundred dollars. You know they're big, really big numbers. So the the reasons would then tend to be the practical reasons of price and size, as opposed to optical or technological issues that they can't break through. I would at, guess at that price just kind of like yeah. you know why can't you make a a fourteen to three hundred zoom lens right. at f two point eight even. Right. You know. Okay, I'm just kind of curious about this, and that that goes back to that question about evolution and you know why we're seeing these fast lenses now. And also keep in mind that, you know, early on, these were hand ground glass optics. Now they're using a lot of composite materials and even some of the finest lenses, they're using some synthetics because they can create lens surfaces in composite materials. They can't do with pure glass. So there's a lot of optical with composites. Total consistency. Total con yes. So I'm there's sure a lot of other better. little things in it and the coatings, coatings are, are different. Better, for yes. sure. All right. I wonder also if the the popularity of astrophotography now has has fueled their their interest in the ultra wide fast. No at, doubt. You know, at night with lower ISO and all that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's one of the. Uh, in fact, I was was reading somebody's little press thing. They're talking about that. Yeah. It cuts the exposure time down. You don't have to pump your ISOs. Your right. noise is down. Well, yeah. Like, and also, you can get those sharp. Milky Way kind of shots where if, if you have a long exposure, you're Too gonna, long. you're gonna get yeah. the uh, little Mike and Ike trail. Mm -hmm. candies. So that leads us to talking about some applications and and night photography, astrophotography. Clearly, is something that would be you know, find architecture, a big benefit. exterior, interior. Okay, so and again, the reason being is that if it's a dim interior, you're going to be able to get more light and you can stop and get a more accurate image mm -hmm. or more a that's clearer part image. Of it. I mean, that's part of it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So interiors, architecture. Night uh, photography. Of course, landscape. Landscape. Yeah. I, I think that's the the biggest need, the biggest request for ultra-wide lens, lenses for landscape. Mm -hmm. What about that's VR? What Is it a... a, a um, I haven't had a lot of people. Occasionally, some someone's looking for something for 360 photography mm -hmm. for VR or something. I mean, I don't know if that's the best the, application the cameras more. I don't know. They're looking at the 360 cameras. Right. That's okay. right. So they don't have to... So why, in, in, in the sense of landscape, would an F... 1.8 be better than an f2.8? Um, not necessarily. Only if you want to shoot with a wider aperture, uh, if you want to get some sense of, of depth. Yeah. Right. So yeah. then it would be easier with a wider aperture or, you know, closing down again, you have, you don't have to worry about the, the time because you're on a and tripod. It, especially or if you're polarizing the scene too, mm -hmm. if your lens first starts at 4.5, 
and you stop down a few stops for, for resolving power, and then you throw a, uh, an, either a neutral density or a polarizer on there, you, you've lost a lot of light. You can't see much through that finder, whereas if you have an F2, 1.8, 1.4 lens, you have a better chance of being able to still see what's going on through the finder, mm -hmm. and your exposures are shorter. Mm -hmm. Again, it keeps coming back to mm -hmm. that. How about underwater photography? Any, uh, yeah, it's a small niche, but well, yeah. underwater, so yeah, benefit, pretty much you know? only wide angle lenses for underwater yeah. photography. Right. That's I don't, so I don't really do is, a lot, a lot yeah. of that, yeah. but uh, you, yes, the faster yeah. the better is always, again, always better. Every More bit of light, speed helps yeah, under there. Uh, uh, everything, yeah. And, yeah. but wide angle lenses are, are much preferred for underwater photography. Sure. And if you can yeah. shoot yeah. the Milky Way from under the water, no two ways about it. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. You, you, do you need an F1.8 lens, 1.4? I wouldn't even one. touch F2 so, at that point. So what applications is it to, does it make no difference for? I mean, obviously, your portrait photography. And we're, and Passport, we're talking, photography. Passport photography. Passport yeah. photography. I mean, wide angle, you know, a lens in itself is not a choice for portrait photography. We realize that, but... Oh, no, 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 no. Actually, without... This is no joke. No, it's yeah. no joke. I used to do a lot of environmental portraits for, for uh, um, editorial stuff and corporate stuff. And I can tell you that I used to regularly use 24 millimeter, 20 millimeter, and even 15 millimeter for environmental portraits mm -hmm. where I position the person central to the frame, not on the corners. And I could photograph them in their workplace, at their desks, uh, in the most strangest things. But, and, and that's another thing, my, on my last, item here, my little talking point, is about discipline and that these lenses do need a discipline to use them well. It's very, it, everything looks very cool when you look through it, but if you're gonna be looking at one distorted picture after another, uh, it gets kind of old real fast. And I think one of the real things that I love about these is when I could use the lens to capture a really powerful photograph that doesn't scream wide angle. And that's the challenge of using these things. Taking a good picture doesn't say, oh, wow, it's because it's wide angle. No, say it's wow, but not understand that it's because of the focal. So you're putting the, the, the subject in the center to reduce the distortion. Yes. If you keep your, with these lines, if you keep them centralized and if you, again, don't go seven inches from their nose, keep them two, three feet away, have them be part of a scene, they're fine. The edges might get distorted a little bit depending on what's going on and how close it is to the lens. But- uh, I, I, yeah, I, I could tell you right now, I've taken some really, what I think are very good uh, uh, portraits using ultra wides, and my clients were happy too. So it wasn't just me. Yeah. And also for for sort of like a, I don't know what you call it, like an, uh, a kind of environmental portrait, but like a landscape with mm -hmm. portrait and you yeah. have somebody in yeah. there, and then yeah. you're, you're getting the advantage for the landscape of the wide angle, and you got somebody in there. Another great application I saw a few times in the past month, uh, some incredible surfing shots at sunset mm -hmm. where people are in the tube and the sun is setting at the other end and you're surrounded by a wall of water and you could only do some of that stuff with an ultra wide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could do it with a 50 millimeter, but I saw some ultra wide angle stuff that was phenomenal. Uh, and again, if it's faster, you're able to sink a little well, you, bit better and everything else. You get that sense of place. Yes. You, know, you really can feel that. Yes, wow. absolutely. Okay. All right. I guess just to summarize, then the the event that faster is always better, right? I Pretty mean, much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If if you can do it, you know, it's nice to know it's there. You don't always need it, but it's nice to know it's there. Okay. Okay. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back. We're going to go through all of the wide angle groups that we have here. We have a whole list of lenses that Fast are out wide there. Angle. Fast wide angle lenses. Stay tuned. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. We are back. John, before we start going through all of the uh, focal lengths and what's out there for fast, uh, uh, wide angle and ultra wide, you pulled out some of the newer lenses in this mm -hmm. uh, group. What are they? Okay. Yeah, this is just from the B&H site. Uh, Sigma has a brand new 14 millimeter F1.8 which is part of their art series. And I just uh, did a review on that, which mm -hmm. came out the other day on Explore. If you want to see a review of it and see the kind of pictures it takes, it's mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. Also relatively new is the Sigma 20 millimeter F1.4, also Canon Nikon Sigma, and the 24 millimeter F4, both part of the art series. And again, 24 Canon, millimeter 1.4. Did I say? What you did said I say? a four. 
F4. F1.4. Yes. 1. 1. 1. 1. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, Nikon has a 24 millimeter, millimeter F1.8 G mm-hmm. lens. Uh, they also have a 20 millimeter F1.8 G. Relatively affordably priced lenses. I also noticed brand new, a uh, Sony, not brand new, but a Sony Distagon T 24 millimeter F2 ZA SSM lens. That's the new ones. Mm-hmm. Okay, why don't we go through uh, starting with the uh, 35 millimeter mm-hmm. class, what's out there. Uh, 35 F2, that's the entry level to our discussion. We have 13 of them, starting with the Yang, Yangnuo. How do you pronounce that? The, the I pronounce it Yangnuo. Okay, Yang Nuo. I hear lots of different pronunciations, but that's all right. <laughs> yeah, oh, that works for me. The Yang Nuo uh, YN cost $87. That's a 35 millimeter F2 lens, okay? Uh, we cannot <laughs> tell you how good or bad it might be. There's also the Mitakan Zongi Creator, which is $149.95 or $160, dep- $160 depending on the mount. Uh, Pentax makes one, so does Canon. Uh, Zeiss. Uh, Zeiss makes two. They make a, just a Distagon T Star for seven forty nine and a Milvis for eleven seventy nine, and also uh, for thirty five f two, there is the Sigma twenty four to thirty five millimeter f two DG HSM art lens, which is a thousand dollars nine ninety nine. That is an amazing zoom range for wide angle, mm-hmm. and an f two is phenomenal. Right. Uh, I imagine you've gotten a lot of well, people well, asking you, about that. You're putting together again a lot of people looking for more range, but you've got an f two aperture, so people just don't realize that it, that it would it would just get so cumbersome to to put more range. It, there are no other lens other than the couple of sigmas that that one that's f two and a couple that are one point eight that we mentioned before eighteen thirty five and fifty to one hundred. There are no lens zoom lenses faster than two point eight. That's right. it. So it's just an amazing thing in in and of itself. Um, so again, it's sort of like the complaint that it's not enough range. You've got a zoom lens that's a f two. What, what's the complaint? You know, it's it's fairly heavy. It's a big sizable lens, which you'd kind of expect. But it's, but it's a very carry, good lens. If you it's carry a, a couple good. of uh, like a, a 24, 28, and a 35, and even right. F2, F2, F2 sure. you've got more weight. In that, you're you're carrying a lot of weight right Absolutely. there. Absolutely. But this kind of lens, I think, is ideal for several things. Street shooting, it's great. All right. Event photography, weddings. I mean, you have a 24, 35, and you're at a wedding reception. You can capture an awful lot right. or any kind of event thing, grip and grin situations. It's a perfect lens. Yeah. And, and those F2 situations is nice. Those situations are really good to have that fast yep. aperture. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you don't need to use a flash as much and right. you've got enough lens. So, and you, the wide angle covers a lot, as you said. So it's really, really ideal for those kinds of situations yeah. as well. They really hit it on that. When I saw that lens announced, I said, no, that, that got but me. But what about the 18 it. to 35? There's, Sigma has a F1.8, right? That's 1.8. That's for APS-C sensor. Okay. All right. Uh, no, that's right. Yeah. So it is amazing. Uh uh, you know, again, if it were for, if it were for a full frame, I, I, it would have to be Need much bigger. Oh, oh be yes, huge. yeah. <laughs> Lift with your knees. Okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, from there we go a little bit faster to 35.18, and we have a lot of choices on this. For full frame, uh, Nikon makes one. Uh, they make one for the uh, – actually, well, hold on. Yes, Nikon, uh, Tamron SP, and also there's a lot of uh, – we're talking about full frame 35. If you want to go APS-C and have the same angle of view of a 35-millimeter lens, Rokinon makes a 21.8 for micro four third and APS-C. Uh, Olympus for uh, micro four thirds has a 1718. That's the equivalent of a 35. That's a nice thing. lens. That's uh, a good lens. And here we have the Sigma 18 to 35 18 APS-C coverage. Um, and Sony has, oh, there's Sonar 2418 ZA. That's for APS-C. And that is a 38, a 35 millimeter equivalent also. So again, we're talking 35, but if you're using a smaller format, there are a lot of lenses available that will do the equivalent job. Um, 3514, it's got, we have a lot of good options, 18 of them. <laughs> uh, for full frame, you start with Bauer. There's a 3514. It's the same as the Sanyang and Rokinon. Uh, they cost three to $400, $479, depending on the mount and which one it is. Um, Sigma makes a gorgeous 3514 art lens. Voigtlander makes a 3514 in an M mount, single or multi coated, depending on what kind of aesthetic look you want. Nikon 3514, an old manual focus AIS that's been around for a million years, a really nice lens. 
Um, if you're shooting small, oh, we have more. The Sony 134G, uh, the Distagon they make. Um, Nikon makes an AFS 3514 for autofocus. Canon has one. Zeiss has one for their ZF series, ZF2, which is for Nikon. And I believe they make a Canon version. We have the Milvis 3514. Um, and then lights, uh, the Sumlux, the TL3514 is spheric. Um, and they also make for their M camera, 3514 is spheric. So there's a bunch of them. And if you're shooting, again, 3514 equivalent for smaller format, for micro four thirds, SLR magic, a 2614 toy lens. Um, APS-C, a yeah, broken on makes a 21 1.4. Fujifilm, for their cameras, they have a 23.14. Uh, if, if you're shooting for micro four-thirds, Panasonic has a 12 millimeter 1.4, which will also give you the same angle of view as a 35 millimeter 1.4 in full frame. Moving right along, 28 millimeter 2.8, five of them in full frame from Sony, Voigtlander, Zeiss, Leica, two from Zeiss. The Otis is there too. Uh, a 28.18. Nikon makes them, uh, and Canon. They both have two lenses. They cost uh, five and change, between five and $600. If you want a little bit faster than 2818, you have 2817 from our friends at Mitagon Zongi, the Free Walker 24 millimeter 1.7. That's for micro four thirds. And there's also, what else we have here? For 28 millimeter one fourth, this is getting to sound like raisin counting. <laughs> um, three lenses, Nikon, Zeiss, and Leica. 24F2, the list are getting short here, folks. <laughs> Hang on, Just bear with us. 24F2, there is, uh, for micro four thirds, there's 12 millimeter F2 uh, from Sam Yang and Rokinon. And Nikon makes a 24F2 manual focus. I've owned three of them over the years. I've always loved that lens. It's a very nice, uh, well-built manual focus lens. 2414, six of them. Bauer, Rokinon, and Sam Ying make their, make their own versions of it. Sigma makes an art lens, which is gorgeous. Fuji for APS-C. They have a 16 millimeter 1.4. Uh, Canon has a 24 1.4 L. Nikon makes an AFS uh, 1.4 GED. And of course, Leica has a Sumalux Aspheric uh, no, M lens. Before we jump ahead, can I ask about some of the, the Canon? <clears throat> Let's talk about Canon and Nikon specifically. What yeah. are the, of these lenses... What are, you know, the workhorse pro lenses? I know you just mentioned the Canon L, and obviously the price is going to distinguish them the a bit, 20, but what are the big ones? Yeah. The 24 one I would say, in the wide-angle class, mm -hmm. are those are. Right. And that's why Sigma went after that. Those are the first art lenses they came out with, with 24 the and 35 one yeah. That's There's a reason why they did that, right. because those were the, that's, that's their lunch. It's Canon and Nikon's lunch. Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, so for this class, those are the ones that would be in there. Um, 21 millimeter. 21 millimeter, F1.8, Voigtlander. They make one in an M mount. Uh, and if you have a, a micro four thirds, they make a, a Nocton 10.5.095. That is a high speed 21 millimeter lens. That's nice. It's like $1,100. Uh, and of course, if you want to spend $7,500, Leica has a Sumalux uh, M1.4 spheric. Mm -hmm. You know, just... Just letting you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is available. Uh, we have a couple of 20 millimeter F2s. There's a, to a Tokina 20 millimeter F2 Furon, which I've shot with. Beautiful lens. Very, very nice. And of course, our friends at Mitakan Zongi have a 20 millimeter F2.5. F2. 4.5x. That's that goofy yeah. lens yeah. that like snaps out of you like like a like clam. <laughs> um, uh, that's a goofy lens, but it's great. 200 bucks. It's a lot of fun. Nikon 20 millimeter 1.8, uh, 7.96. They make a 20 millimeter 1.4. This is Sigma. Excuse me, 20 millimeter 1.4 art lens. That is a gorgeous lens. Well, that's and one of the new ones. Yeah. That's one of the new pups. Yeah, that's. I've not shot with that, but I, I'd like to see that one. IREX 15 millimeter 2.4 is $400. Why do we have that there? Because it's an IREX 15 millimeter. Okay, 2.4, we, we slipped one in there. Uh, and last but not least is the lens we've been talking about uh, all day here. The Sigma 14 millimeter F1.8 DG HSM is amazing. Uh, as I said, I, I have 15, I have two or three 15 millimeter lenses. They're a lot slower. Shooting at f1.8 with this lens close, especially close up, was a whole other experience, a great, great lens. 
So Neil, can I ask? It, you? Oh, go ahead. Uh, they're doing really well also with the wide angle lens. There's very little distortion in general. Yeah, yeah. Even the uh, um, uh, twelve twenty four, it's not it's not below two, but it's uh, uh, f four, I think. But it's you know amazingly uh, mm -hmm. very little distortion. By the way, something we should know about distortion is that one of the big issues. If you look at some of these lenses, the specs are very similar. And again, one will cost three hundred, and one will cost two thousand dollars, and uh, while the resolving power, the sharpness of a lot of these lenses, even wide open, is magnificent, and you stop them down, I think it's fair to say they're all really good. Some are amazing, but they're all really good. But the bigger difference between the less expensive and the more expensive has to do with distortions. Uh, as an example, uh, we were talking earlier about the Rokin on Samyang, the 14 millimeter two weights. Those lenses are incredible for how much they cost. Uh, however, if you're shooting architecture with them, you're going to have to do some post on it because uh, straight lines, rather than being remaining parallel, look like Salvador Dali mustaches. <laughs> there, there can be, especially towards the edge, a lot of what they call uh, well, this pin, this pin, uh, pin cushion distortion. Barrel distortion and mustache distortion. <laughs> uh, now, these are all correctable. That's your own term, I guess. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> you heard it here first. I should have seen that written. <laughs> no, it's actually been described. That, uh, okay. I, I, I didn't make that one up. I actually saw that, and it's really appropriate. Um, these are correctable post, almost yeah. invariably. But you have to do work. But you could save yourself a lot of money. And again, resolving power, they're sharp. Mm -hmm. hmm. So, Neil, what do you see as big purchases over there, what are people asking for when, whether it comes to pro photographers or prosumers, enthusiasts in terms of this, this class of lens? Um, they're looking at the Sigmas and, and more than the Canons and Nikons mm -hmm. and the Rokinon is very, very popular. Uh, you know, again, because of the price point, it's got a reputation of being very, very, uh, sharp. And in addition, a lot of people for video are manually focusing anyway, yeah. so they don't even care. It doesn't even matter. And, and by the way, I think for landscape and general photography, the distortions, you, you really won't notice them. Right. Okay, it's only when you're doing things with straight lines like architecture. Then it becomes critical. But for a lot of shooting, it's in the background. You yeah. don't see it. Yeah. And the Lightroom corrections for the lens are, are yeah. very, very good. Yeah. 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 I mean, there, there are several different uh, software packages that'll correct. As soon as you as soon as soon you load the, the image in, it knows the lens, the camera, and it... Yeah. You put it the lens in, in that's there, it. Corrects it. Says, it. Yeah. Automatically, yeah. Yeah. It's so, cool. Yeah. It's very good. For the people that have that lens, the Roki Non or the Samyang 14 millimeter, is there a solution for filters that, that you recommend? Because you know that it has that hood that doesn't come off. Well, there are filters that that are mount from the back of the lens, the holder, um, that are, that are going to be um, dedicated for each specific lens. Um, I know that they're certainly available for the Nikons and the Canons and the, and the uh, Sigmas. I don't think I've come across any, although it doesn't mean they're not there for, for Rokinon. So it mounts from the back and then they use a standard drop-in filter. Then for video, people use matte boxes. And I then see, they so it's from the back, so that gets around the problem of you not being able to screw anything onto the front of it. Correct. Right? Yeah. So you're not using UV filters for protection, but you can for other things, for neutral density or, or landscape stuff, you know, graduated neutral density, you can use these uh, for a lot of them. But they're specific because each lens is different. So you have to have the, the – the, they used to make the whole thing that was specific for the lens. Now they, they have the, the part that comes from the back, the, the, the mount is specific, and the, the holder is the same holder for anything, so for any of the, those lenses. And it's big, wide, 150-millimeter filter. Right, right. You know, there's one thing that we didn't mention in terms of the application, which is street photography. And, you know, that's something that I like to do. And a faster lens means you can – you know, up that shutter speed and yep. you can freeze those moments in the street yep. that you might not otherwise be able to do. Yeah, the size is going to be a disadvantage clearly in the street, but uh, but that's one thing to consider. Often yeah. the 35 millimeter, which is not ultra wide, is often the preferred angle of view for mm -hmm. street photography. Right. Some people want wider. Some people even like longer lenses. They want to see be more in the background. Mm -hmm. You know, they want mm -hmm. to go from across the street, so they're looking for a longer lens. But generally, 35 millimeter is somewhere around that range is more preferred. Um, and that's easy to achieve. I mean, whether you're yeah. look, looking at a, a 24 for a, a crop sensor or the 35 on the full frame sensor. Mm -hmm. um, and going forward, do you think we're going to be seeing more wide ultra fast, or if you want to call them ultra fast, but, you know, something below F2? Is that something that uh, 
there's going to be a new generation coming out from the big makers or some small manufacturers popping up to kind of make these? Is it that interesting, that important right now? Well, they're always upgrading lenses, you mm -hmm. know, not all at one time, but occasionally they'll come out with new. Canon has this 11 to 24. Yeah. Not fast, it's f4, but that's for a full frame, again, kind of amazing. I mean, that with very little distortion. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a really, it's an excellent lens, not not among the fast lenses, but um, so they're always looking and again, technology improving, things are getting better, so they might want to make the same lens, and now it's a better version. Canon just came out with a, well, maybe a year ago, with a 35 one mm -hmm. That's just astounding. I mean, there's, the chromatic aberration is gone pretty much. It's an excellent lens. So, you know, at one point it was like, well, the Sigma looks better than the Canon, but now that Canon is starting to look, you know. It, it, well, you know, I think it's an, one of the things that's, that's causing uh, lens manufacturers to up the game and make even better lenses than they've been doing already is the fact that a lot of the cameras have sensors that are just ridiculously high in, res in resolving power. And the older lens, older generation, don't hold they don't. up. I Thank have you know. lenses that I, I used to swear by that I look at now I swear at them yeah. because the, the, my camera out resolves them. It just beats them. That's absolutely true. And, and a lot of people have no understanding or no uh, consideration for that. You know, they could have a lens. It could be a really nice lens. Some of the lenses will work really well with the APS-C format, but on the full frame, not as much. So certainly when you get to the cameras with 30 and 36 and 42 and, and 50, 50 and megapixels, yeah. They just do not have the resolving power to maintain the sharpness and Well, a good example, even, this is nothing new because if, if you go back about 25 years ago, Leica started to redesign all their lenses. That's when they started producing uh, all their spheric lenses. They started redesigning them. And why did they do that? Because Leica lenses were the best out there at the time and still are. But they realized that film technology was getting to a point where it was matching the quality of the lenses and they had up their game to hold on to that edge that made them the best out there. So film did it and now digital is doing it. And we all win for that because we have lenses that are just amazing now. Yeah. Okay, there you have it. Everything you need to know about ultra fast, ultra wide angle lenses, all right? <laughs> Everybody's exhausted by now. Anyway, uh, Neil Gershman, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and Neil is in the store. He's one of our, top, like I said, our top pro sales guys. And if you're going to be in the store, head up to the counter, say hi and pick his brains. In the meantime, if you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, head over to iTunes, sign up. It's free. And while you're there, take a look at all 80 plus episodes we have. How many episodes? We have a bunch this of them. This is number 84. This is number 84. And they're all up there and they're all uh, accessible anytime you want, 24-7. Yeah, imagine many people here that are listening are subscribers, but, you know, encourage your friends to subscribe. You know, subscribing is the best way to help our show. Yeah, offer them a few bucks. Tell them you give them $5. <laughs> You'll buy them a Starbucks if they sign up, okay? And then drop us a note. We'll reimburse you, okay? Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> He's kidding. That could get you into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. So there you have it. On behalf of John Harris, Jason Tables, and myself, thank you so much for tuning in today. 